on that too. From Mahatma Gandhi to every Englishman living in India. During a fateful period of the non-cooperation movement of the year 1920 and 1921, Mahatma Gandhi addressed two soul-striving writers to the Englishman residing in India. These writers will go as most important documents in the annals of Indian history. The coming generations will read these writers with immense interest and would bow their heads with reverence to the memory of a great soul, Mahatma Gandhi. In these letters, the Mahatma laid bare his sincerest feelings before the Englishman. The lines speak of the inestimably deep sense of the love which the Mahatma has for humanity at last. He made it plain to every Englishman in India that he had no goals against individuals. He did not hate the British nation. It was the vicious system of British imperialism he was fighting. And he, in good faith, invited even the Englishman to join hands with him in the above preferred fight against the system. Join me in destroying this system. This is the title of the letter. Dear friend, I wish that every Englishman will see this appeal and give thoughtful attention to it. Let me introduce myself to you. In my humble opinion, no Indian has cooperated with the British government more than I have for an unbroken period of 29 years of public life in the face of circumstances that might well have turned any other man into a waver. I ask you to believe me when I tell you that my cooperation was not based on the fear of the punishments provided by your laws or any other selfish motives. It was free and voluntary cooperation based on the belief that the sum total of the British government was for the benefit of India. I put my life in peril four times for the sake of the empire at the time of Boer Bar when I was in charge of the ambulance corps whose work was mentioned in General Bula's dispatches at the time of Juru revolt in Natal when I was in charge of a similar corps at the time of commencement of the late war, when I waged an ambulance corps and as a result of the strenuous training had a severe attack of purists and rastery in fulfillment of my promise to Lord James Ford at the war conference in Delhi. I threw myself in such an active recruiting campaign in Kaiwa district involving long and trying marches that I had an attack of dysentery which proved almost fatal. I did all this in the full belief that acts such as mine must gain for my country an equal status in the empire. So last December, I pleaded hard for a trustful cooperation. I fully believed that Mr. Lloyd George would redeem his promise to the Muslims and that the revelation of the official atrocities in the Punjab would secure full reparation for the Punjabis. But the treasury of Mr. Lloyd George and its appreciation by you and the condonation of the Punjab atrocities have completely shattered my faith in the good intention of the government and the nation which is supporting it. But though my faith in your good intentions is gone, I recognize your bravery and I know that part you will not yield to justice and reason. You will gladly yield to bravery. See what this empire means to India, exploitation of India's resources for the benefit of Great Britain, an ever-increasing military expenditure and a civil service, the most expensive in the world. Extravagant workings of every department in utter disregard of India's poverty, disarmament and consequent immaculation of a whole nation reached an armed nation might imperil the lives of a handful of you in our minds, mildest. Traffic in intoxicating illegals and drugs for the purpose of sustaining a top-heavy administration. Progressively representative legislation in order to suppress an ever-growing agitation seeking to give expression to a nation's agony. 
degrading treatment of Indians residing in your dominions and you have shown total disregard of our feelings by glorifying the Punjab administration and floating the Muslim sentiments. I know you would not mind it if you if we could fight and wrest the capture for your hand from your hands. You would that be our you know that we are powerless to that do that for you have ensured our incapacity to fight in open and unwavering battle. Bravery on the battlefield is thus impossible for us. Bravery of the soul still remains open to us. I know you will respond to that also. I am engaged in evoking that bravery. Non-cooperation means nothing less than training in self-sacrifice. Why should we cooperate with you and when we know that By your administration of this great country, we are being daily enslaved in an increasing degree. This response of the pupil to my appeal is not due to my personality. I would like you to dismiss me, and for that matter, the Ali brothers too, from your consideration. My personality will fail to evoke any response to anti-Muslim cry if I were foolish enough to raise it as a magic name of the Ali brothers would fail to inspire the Muslims with enthusiasm if they were madly to raise an anti-Hindu cry. People flock in their thousands to listen to us because we today represent the voice of a nation groaning under iron heels. The Ali brothers were your friends as I was and still am. My religion forbids me to bear any ill will towards you. I would not raise my hand against you even if I had the power. I expect to confer you only by my suffering. The Ali brothers will certainly draw the sword if they could in defense of their religion and their country. But they and I have made common cause with the people of India in their attempt to voice their feelings and to find a remedy for their distress. You are in search of a remedy to suppress. This rising abolition of nation national feeling, I venture to suggest to you that the only way to suppress it is to remove the causes. You have yet the power. You can repent the wrongs done to Indians. You can compel Mr. Lloyd George to redeem his promises. I assure you, he has kept many escapes, escape doors. You can compel the viceroy to retire in favor of a better one. You can revise your ideas about Sir Michel O. Dyer and General Dyer. You can compel the government to summon a conference of the recognized leaders of the pupil duly erected by them and representing all shades of opinion so as to devise means for granting Swaraj in accordance with the wishes of the pupil of India. But this you cannot do unless you consider every Indian to be in reality your equal and brother. I ask for no patronage. I merely point out to you, as a friend, an unwavering solution of a great problem. The other solution, namely repression, is open to you. I prophesy that it will fail. It has begun already. The government has already imprisoned two brave men of Panipat for holding and expressing their opinions freely. Another is on his trial in Lahore for having expressed similar opinions. The fourth district is already imprisoned. Another awaits judgment. You should know what is going on in your midst. Propaganda is being carried on in anticipation of repression. I invite you respectfully to choose the better way and make common cause with the people of India whose sort you are eating, to seek the to thwart their aspiration is disloyalty to the country. I am your faithful friend, M. K. Gandhi. To every Englishman living in India, second letter. This is the title of the letter. You are as much slaves as we. Dear friends, this is the second time I venture to address you. I know that most of you detest non-cooperation, but I would invite you to isolate two of my activities from the rest if you can give me credit for honesty. 
I cannot prove my honesty if you do not feel it. Some of my Indian friends charge me with camouflage when I say we need not hate English men. Why is we may hate the system they have established. I am trying to show them that one may detest the wickedness of a brother without hating him. Jesus denounced the wickedness of the scribes and the Pharisees, but he did not hate them. He did not enunciate this law of love for the man and hate for the evil in him for himself only, but he taught the doctrine for universal practice. Indeed, I find it in all the scriptures of the world. I claim to be a fairly accurate student of human nature and be the sector of my own feeling. I have discovered that man is superior to the system he propounds and so I feel that you as an individual are infinitely better than the system you have evolved as a corporation. Each one of my countrymen in Amritsar on that faithful 10th of April was better than the crowd of which he was a member. He as a man who have declined to kill those innocent English bank managers, but in that crowd many a man forgot himself. Hence it is that an English man in office is different, different from an English man outside. Similarly, an English man in India is different from an English man in England. Here in India you belong to a system that is well beyond description. It is possible, therefore, for me to condemn the system in the strongest terms without considering you to be bad and without imputing bad motives to every Englishman. You are as much slaves of the system as we are. I want you there for to reciprocate and not immute to impute to me motives which you cannot read in the written word. I give you the whole of my motive when I tell you that I am impatient to end or mend a system which has made India subservient to a handful of you and which has made Englishmen feel secure only in shadows of the forts and the guns that are obtrude themselves on one's notice in India. It is de degrading a spectacle for you and for us. Our corporate life is based on mutual distrust and fear. This, you will admit, is unmanly. A system that is responsible for such a state of things is necessarily satanic. You should be able to live in India as an integral part of its people and not always as foreign exploiters. 1000 Indian lives against one English life is a doctrine of despair. And yet, believe me, it was enunciated in 1919 by the highest of you in the land. I almost feel tempted to invite you to join me in destroying a system that has dragged both you and us down. But I feel I cannot as yet do so. We have not sown ourselves earnest, self-sacrificing and self restrained enough for that consummation. But I do ask you to help us in the boycott of foreign cloth and in the anti-drink campaign. The Lancashire Lan cloth as English historians have sown, was forced upon India and her own world-famed manufacturers were deliberately and systematically ruined. India is therefore at the mercy not only of Lancashire but also of Japan, France and America. Just see what this has meant to India. We sent out of India every year 60 crores, more or less of rupees for cloth. We grow enough cotton for our own cloth. Is it not madness to send cotton outside India and have it manufactured into cloth there and shipped to us? Was it right to reduce India to such a helpless state? A hundred and fifty years ago, we manufactured all our cloth. Our women spun fine yarn in their own cottages and supplemented the earnings of their husbands. The village weavers wove their yarn. It was an indispensable part of national economy in vast agricultural countries like ours. It enables us in a most natural manner to utilize our leisure. Today our women have lost the cunning 
of their hands and the enforced idleness of millions have impoverished the land. Many weavers have become sweepers. Some have taken to the profession of hired soldiers. Half the race of artistic weavers have died out and the other half is weaving imported foreign yarn for want of final hand spun yarn. You will perhaps now understand what boycott of foreign cloth means to India. It is not devised as a punishment. If the government were today to redress the Khilafat and the Punjab wrongs and consent to India attaining immediate Swaraj, the boycott movement must still continue. Swaraj means at least the power to conserve Indian industries that are vital to the economic existence of the nation and to prohibit such imports as may interfere with such existence. Agriculture and hand spinning are the two lungs of the national body. They must be protected against consumption at any cost. This matter does not admit of any waiting. The interest of the foreign manufacturers and the Indian importers cannot be considered when a whole nation is starving for want of a large productive occupation and ancillary to agriculture. You will not mistake this for a movement of general boycott of foreign goods. India does not wish to serve, shut herself out of international commerce. Things other than cloth which can be better made outside India, she must gracefully receive upon terms advantageous to the con contracting parties. Nothing can be forced upon her, but I do not wish to peep into the future. I am certainly hoping that before long it would be possible for India to cooperate with England on equal terms. Then will be the time for examining trade relations. For the time being, I beseech your help in bringing about a boycott of foreign clothes. Of similar and equal importance is the campaign against drink. The liquor shops are an insufferable curse imposed on society. There never was so much awakening among the people as now upon this question. I admit that here it is the Indian ministers who can help more than you can. But I would like you to speak out your mind clearly on the questions. Under every system of government, total prohibition so far as I can see will be insisted upon by the nation. You can assist the growth of the ever rising agitation by throwing in the weight of your influence on the side of the nation. I am your faithful friend M.K. Gandhi.